All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to join us for this evening's special event, Art in the U.S.-Japan Relationship, a curator's perspective. Uh, my name is Yoshi Domoto. I'm the executive director of the Japan America Society of Georgia, and I'm so thrilled to see so many people with us in person and online as well. Uh, for all of our members in attendance, thank you very much for all of your continued support. And please feel free to contact our office anytime uh, if we can serve you better. For those of you here for your first JASG event, welcome and yokoso. Uh, we certainly encourage you to join our membership and hope you'll enjoy tonight's program and become more acquainted uh, with our organization. But uh, with our mission to promote the mutual understanding between the people of Japan and Georgia, uh, tonight's program about Japanese art will hopefully enable all of you to better appreciate both Japanese art and the impact it has had not only on Western art, but also popular culture throughout the world too. Uh, but now it is my pleasure to introduce you to the chair of the Japan American Society of Georgia, Ms. Jessica Gord. Jessica. Hey. So thank you um, so much, Yoshi. And um, Japan and Georgia really share so many um, connections. And I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but historically, the start of the Georgia-Japan relationship um, dates back to the beginning of U.S.-Japan relations because the adjunct general of the state of Georgia, John McIntosh Kell, was part of Commodore Perry's expedition to open trade with Japan. And that was just after Hokusai's lifetime. And economically, there are now more than 600 Japanese affiliated companies in Georgia, and they've invested over $10 billion. And they employ nearly 37,000 workers in our state. But while economic ties between the US and Japan are certainly important, the connection through the arts are just as important, if not more important, as they help promote the mutual understanding between the people of Japan and the people of the US on a grassroots level. So tonight's event is part of the Richard J. Wood Art Curator Series, in which Japanese art is highlighted through the Japan America Society Network throughout the country. So to begin our evening, please let me thank our sponsors for their generous support and helping to make not only this event, but all of the programs part of this series possible. So our sponsors are the US-Japan Friendship Commission and the National Association of Japan America Societies. And actually on a personal level, I'm really excited about tonight's events. I grew up actually 90 minutes outside of Boston and my parents took me to the Museum of, of Fine Arts many times when I was a child. And I've been interested in Japanese culture for as long as I can remember, but one of the places that I'm sure first sparked that interest was the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, it's an extraordinarily beautiful building. So if you ever get to go to Boston, and please visit the building, has a wonderful traditional Japanese garden there as well, which I remember so well. That's called Tenshin-en, or the Garden of the Heart of Heaven. It's a beautiful name. And of course, there's over 100,000 Japanese works of art, which I can't wait to hear about tonight. So, um, you know, art really has the power to transport us to destination all over the world. And my 10-year-old self definitely fell in love with Japan in the galleries of the MFA. So I'm very excited. So to begin our evening, it is now my pleasure to introduce our good friend and the president of the National Association of the Japan America Societies, Mr. Peter Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. What a, what a nice story about your interest in Japan. Uh, I'm Peter Kelly of the National Association of Japan America Societies. Our offices are located in Washington, D.C. There are 38 Japan America societies all around the country, and all of them have the mission that, that Yoshi described as, as, that, as that of here in, in Georgia, to facilitate and deepen personal ties, people to people ties between Japanese and the local community. The oldest of the uh, Japan America societies, those 38, is located in Boston, which is, and has a close connection with the story that, uh, that Sarah Thompson is going to tell this evening. The National Association of Japan American Societies, our job is to help provide quality Japan related programming to all of our members. We run uh, six different series, which are competitive, a public affairs series, a geo strategy series, two business programs, one in partnership with K Donovan, Japanese companies, business in the United States, and the other in partnership with the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan the business of Japanese companies, American companies, I should say, in Japan. 
We run a security program honoring Americans who served in the US military in Japan. And the program you're gonna to hear tonight is our cultural program. And when I describe all those program offerings, some of you will regard those as familiar because the, the Japan America Society of Georgia regularly wins each of those, each of those events. Uh, in this past year, the uh, society has hosted the program on the ja on Japanese business in the United States with Mitsubishi Electric, on the uh, American businesses in Japan with uh, AFLAC, and an upcoming one with uh, with Delta. You know, you've also had Japan and currents programs a number of years. And in the upcoming year, the society will host the geostrategy program with two interesting speakers, one from the United States and one from Japan talking about the importance of China in the, uh, for the, both the United States and Japan. So the society is very successful. Congratulations to, uh, to, to uh, Yoshi and Maki and all of you for, uh, for, for your uh, very effective use of Japan of NAGIS programs. The program we have tonight, as Jessica mentioned, is called the Richard J. Wood Art Curator Series. And we started it in 2015 because it was clear, it's clear that, as, as Jessica mentioned, the art has been such an important part of the U.S.-Japan relationship since the beginning, since the 19th century. And one of the results of that is wonderful collections of Japanese art in American museums all over the country. We wanted to highlight the importance of those collections, the actual art itself, but also the stories of the collectors. Why are there collections of Japanese art in, in American museums, including the Museum of Fine Arts? So we organized a program in which we ask curators of those collections to come to, to, uh, to cities like Atlanta and talk about their collections, what they like about them best and why they're there and the motivations of both the museum and the collector. This year's series has featured programs from Frank Feltons, who's the, who's the uh, Japanese painting curator at the Freer Gallery of the Smithsonian Institute, Institution in Washington. Sarah, Sarah uh, here in, um, at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. We've also had Rhiannon Paget, who has, is a curator of uh, Japanese prints at the, Saras, at the uh, Ringling Museum in Sarasota, Florida. Dakin Hart, who is the curator of the uh, Noguchi Museum in Brooklyn. And actually, just before I came here today, I took a short walk in your wonderful Piedmont Park, and I passed through the Noguchi uh, Playscape, in which they refer to the museum and the, the Noguchi Museum in Long Island City in, uh, in, in New York. Um, so this program really features curators talking about the collections that they their museums have built. We're very lucky to have uh, to have Sarah Thompson here uh, tonight. Sarah is one of four curators of Japanese art at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And together with her fellow curators, they are responsible for the largest collection of Japanese art outside of Japan. The, uh, Sarah has a degree in linguistics, an undergraduate degree in linguistics from Harvard and a PhD in Japanese art from Columbia. She has taught at Oberlin and Vassar and University of uh, Oregon came to the Museum of Fine Arts in 2004. The most recent book is about the topic of today's uh, talk, uh, Hokusai, a complete uh, 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 study of, uh, of Hokusai's prints. So with that, let us welcome our featured guest. These programs are, the, the joy of these programs is the curators and their, and their joy at their art. So Sarah, welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that uh, that uh, lovely uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that. Um, shall I shall I move on already to the um, to the beginning of the? Oh, we got a little ahead. We need to backtrack slightly. Why is it not? Oh. Okay, there we go. Yes, that was what I was looking for. All right, thank you. Sorry for the little slight, uh, slight technical glitch here. Uh, but once again, oops. One more. One more. 
Okay. To, to make my uh, lack of a mask more legitimate, I'm going to be sipping water from time to time. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, thank you everyone for those, uh, those lovely introductions. Uh, and we will uh, start in with Hokusai. Um, I'm sure you all know the uh, the image up at the uh, up at the top left, um, and the one at the top right um, is almost equally famous. Um, in fact, in Japan, they they like the one nicknamed the Red Fuji uh, even better than the one that is nicknamed the Great Wave. And you see both of these very very often. Um, these are color woodblot prints. I'll explain in a moment how they're made. Um, and I put in two more images of the same kind, just to give you an idea of the artist's range. Um, he also does things like ferocious warriors fighting each other and beautiful birds and flowers and many, many other things also. So I uh, am actually, um, we, we currently at the moment are down to a mere three curators for our Japanese art collection, but uh, that is because one, uh, one of us uh, has gone back to Japan and his replacement will be coming in a while. Uh, but normally we do indeed have uh, have four people. Why so many? Um, well, um, it's because we have so many works of Japanese art. Um, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston has um, roughly about 500,000 items total, of which about 100,000 are Japanese. Now, I think this clearly means that we should be getting 20% of the museum's resources. Um, unfortunately, the administration does not agree with that, but, but still, we are pretty substantial. Um, and of that large number of uh, Japanese works of art, um, about half of them are, uh, are woodblock prints. Um, I, the precise number, it, well, it's not that precise, but about 52,000 if you count each sheet of paper as one object. Of course, many of them are put together into diptychs or triptychs or larger compositions. Um, and if you count each one of those as only one instead of two or three or five or however many, then we only have about 46,000. Um, but this is definitely the largest collection of Japanese prints outside Japan. Um, it's one of the largest in the world. Um, we're not absolutely sure how we rank because none of the other big collections have actually counted uh, how many they have uh, yet. Uh, we're one of, the, uh, one of the only ones that has. I think we're probably number two after the Japan Ukiyo-e Museum in Matsumoto. They think they have about 100,000, but as I said, they haven't counted. So we'll just have to wait to find out. Um, and um, a number of these are uh, by Hokusai. Um, his works include paintings. Uh, up at the top, you see a beautiful screen of a, a phoenix. Um, it's actually rather small in, uh, in height, um, and we think it was intended to uh, be set up uh, around um, a bed, which of course, as you know, in Japan is, is quilts on the floor, but a, a rather short screen would be very nice to block any drafts from, uh, from getting on you, uh, but obviously in a very elegant uh, setting. Uh, so that's what the beautiful Phoenix painting is. And the other two things I'm showing you are uh, examples of the things that Hokusai is most famous for. Um, of course, the most famous of all his print designs, um, nicknamed The Great Wave. Its real title is Under the Wave off Kanagawa. Um, people are often surprised that it's rather small. The real thing is only about like that. Um, and of course, because it's a print, uh, there are multiples of them. Uh, many museums have one. We have seven. Or maybe I should say six and a half because one of ours is, is half faked. It's got some original blocks and some uh, replacements. Um, but uh, then the third thing that I'm showing you obviously is a book. Uh, also woodblock printed in the same way as the, uh, as the print, um, the single sheet print. Uh, and this particular book uh, was actually the first thing that Hokusai became super famous for. Um, it's uh, from a series that was originally 10 volumes, uh, and then it was such a huge bestseller that the publishers stuck on five more. Um, started coming out in 1815, and it is the famous Hokusai manga. Um, although we translate that as sketches by Hokusai, um, the word manga, of course, is well known today as meaning um, comic strips, comic books, graphic stories, 
Um, but it meant something a little bit different 200 years ago. It meant sketches or casual drawings, um, maybe a study for a finished painting or maybe not, something that the artist just dashes off. And you can see how easy it would be for that meaning to shift into um, the idea of a, a graphic story. Uh, but uh, the manga were very, very famous. The book was a bestseller. Uh, he became a household a name in Japan because of that. Uh, and as we'll see, it was the first of his works uh, then to become famous overseas um, shortly after his death. So this is what we have. Um, these are my three books about Hokusai so far. And another one is, is in the planning. Um, and I, I do do other things also. Um, in fact, um, since the Hokusai's Landscapes book, there has been yet another one, not about Hokusai, that just came out. Um, I think of it as my quarantine book because that was, you know, what, what I did in my, um, in my unwilling summer vacation last summer. Um, but um, I have another one out on uh, parodies of the tale of Genji. Um, and just by happy coincidence, uh, I understand that the society owns some of those, and there are a couple of them over there. I looked at them and went, oh, those are in my new book. Anyway, um, here are the three Hokusai books. There will soon, um, as of 2023, be a fourth Hokusai book because we're planning another Hokusai-related exhibition. Uh, we had a big, rec uh, excuse me, a big retrospective uh, at the MFA in 2015, uh, works uh, all by Hokusai except for one by his daughter. Um, and we are now planning another show in 2023. The working title is Hokusai's Legacy. Of course, we're still a year and a half out, so there may be all kinds of changes uh, in the plans, um, but the idea is to show uh, Hokusai and his impact on other people, uh, particularly his students, including his daughter, um, but uh, also uh, various others. So my talk tonight is going to be in three parts. I'll uh, talk first about Hokusai himself, um, looking especially at the works that were in, uh, that were in the 2015 show. Um, then I will get into the question of how these things got to Boston and show you some of the people who were involved in, uh, in that uh, connection uh, between uh, the US and Japan. Uh, and then uh, at the end, I'll uh, tell you about some of the plans for the new show and what's coming up. So any one of these three things I could easily talk about for an hour. So I'll try to keep it moving along and not run over too badly. Now, um, again, many of you probably know this already, uh, but just a reminder of how the ukiyo-e prints were made um, and the printed books uh, also were done by the same method. Uh, in fact, printed books came first uh, and then the single sheet prints developed out of that. Um, the books uh, were uh, very popular uh, in the 17th century. And then in roughly around 1680 or so, some clever publisher realized that they could sell the pictures even without the uh, book. So that became an added product line uh, also sold in the bookstores along with the books. You could get just the printed pictures. So the artists are very prolific. Um, people in Western art are always surprised at the large number of works that the Japanese print artists produced, but that's because all they did was draw pictures. They were not physically making the blocks and doing the printing themselves, as in most cases, European artists did. Um, so uh, here are the four people, at least, that are involved. And of course, uh, any one of them might have assistance, so there might be other people too. The artist draws the picture. Uh, the block cutter uh, takes that picture and turns it into a carved block. So people sometimes want to know what happened to the original. Um, well, in one sense, it's long gone because it was destroyed in the process of making the block. Um, in another sense, uh, each one of the finished prints is considered to be an original, uh, even though there are uh, multiples of them. So the block cutter uh, takes the drawing, glues it to a wooden block, usually cherry wood, face down, um, it gets it wet so you can see through it if necessary, maybe rubs away a little bit of the back so you can just see the ink lines, and then uses that as a pattern and carves um, a printing block um, with, the, with the area where the ink lines are uh, left raised while everything is carved away. Then if it's going to be a color print, you'll have a separate block uh, for, each, uh, for each color. 
you can take the your so-called key block, make some prints from it, uh, and then use them the same way that you used uh, the original drawing, um, carefully marking uh, the areas that you want to be printed in each color. So that's the way it done. It's done. This goes to the printer, yet another person. Uh, the printer uh, is sitting on the floor at a little desk, uh, and uh, they put the ink on the block, slap the piece of paper down on top of it, and rub with a pad. Um, there's no printing press involved. It's all by hand. Um, now, none of these people are actually in control of the process. Uh, the big cheese is the publisher uh, who has uh, selected each of them, and they're all working for him. Uh, and then he takes the finished prints and sells them uh, in a bookstore. Um, or sometimes there might be uh, salespeople who would go around on the streets with, uh, with prints uh, and books for sale. So this is the so-called ukiyo-e quartet. This is how it was done. And book illustration by Hoka Seishon in the bookstore. Here are some modern people making reproductions. I was talking to some of you about reproductions and how they're done. There are people uh, in Japan, not very many of them, but some still doing it by the old process. Mostly they make reproductions of the old prints. Occasionally um, a present day artist uh, will uh, have work of their own done uh, by this method also. Although it isn't very common anymore, most print artists do their own uh, block carving and printing and so on. Now, uh, as for Hokusai himself, actually I'm going to backtrack for just a moment so that you can see the block cutter uh, on the uh, left and then the printer on the right. Hokusai himself is said uh, to have worked for a short time when he was in his teens as a block cutter. And certainly uh, in his later writings, uh, it's something that he knew a lot about and was very particular about. Uh, we have letters to his publishers where he says things like, please hire so-and-so to do the block cutting uh, for this, uh, this project. He's much better than anyone else, um, and so on. So he clearly knows about it. Um, his background, um, there are many things we don't know about him. Uh, we don't really know uh, what his, his birth father did for a living or what the circumstances of the family uh, were. Um, he was a city boy in the, the city that was then called Edo, which of course, as you know, is Tokyo now. Um, and they were artisan class. So they were not uh, members of the ruling samurai class. However, they did have good connections and there was uh, some samurai ancestry on his mother's side. So apparently uh, as a child, he was adopted by his uncle. Um, we assumed that the uncle was probably fairly well off and did not uh, have an heir. Um, so this was a fairly common thing to do to adopt a younger child of one of your relatives and bring that, uh, that child up to, to inherit the business. Uh, his uncle's business was uh, making mirrors, uh, a mirror polisher um, in, a, in the service of the high-ranking samurai families uh, at the shogun's court. Um, so um, the mirrors were made out of metal, very highly polished, um, and they were uh, expensive status symbols. So as I said, this is an artisan family, but one with good connections in high places, probably fairly well off. And Hokusai was very interested in reflections and optical issues all, all through his artistic career. And I, I think that may have been why. However, uh, he didn't want to be a mirror polisher. I kind of suspect he may have had a personality clash with his uncle. I, I can easily imagine, you know, this, this bright teenage boy rebelling against what he was supposed to do in life and deciding to do something different and running off. Um, he supposedly worked in a bookstore for a while. He worked as a, as a block cutter. Finally, when he was 19, uh, he joined the studio of one of the top ukiyo-e artists uh, of the time. So ukiyo-e, um, again, the pictures of the floating world, uh, it's the school of art includes, uh, as we saw, paintings, book illustrations, and prints. Um, and at the time, the most popular subjects were uh, things from the popular culture, the so-called floating world, and that meant mainly kabuki actors and beautiful women in fashionable clothing, um, especially the courtesans of the Yoshiwara, but also uh, other women uh, as well. So I show you some examples of what the young man who was going to grow up to be Hokusai uh, started learning when he was 19. Uh, there is a diptych, two sheets that fit together, uh, showing a kabuki play. 
um, from 1781. We know this because uh, people have been able to identify the play. Um, and his teacher, Katsukawa Shunsho, was very good at getting the likeness of the actors, doing very dramatic scenes um, that were very thrilling for Kabuki fans and people wanted to run out and buy. And so this was what uh, the young artist who took the name Katsukawa Shunro, um, one syllable the same as his uh, teachers or one and when one uh, different. Um, and you see a work by him uh, from 10 years later uh, after he'd been learning for, uh, for 12 years um, on the right. And he obviously is also very, very good and has learned from his teacher uh, how to get a good likeness of an actor, how to do dramatic poses. Um, this is actually the right half of a, a very dramatic uh, confrontation scene uh, that takes place in a graveyard at night. You see the actor holding a, a skull it always makes me think of Hamlet. Um, and uh, so, uh, so this is what uh, the future Hokusai learned. Um, he also learned about a painting of beautiful women in fashionable outfits. Uh, this is a slightly later, this a five sheet print, which is very, very unusual for him. As far as I know, this is the only one he ever did, but a five sheet print uh, showing the interior of one of the very elegant, very expensive uh, brothels uh, in the Yoshiwara, which was another major feature of the floating world. It's done after he had left the Katsukawa school, but clearly using things that he had learned there. So Shunsho, the teacher, died in 1792. Soon after that, uh, Hokusai left the Katsukawa school. We don't know exactly why. Uh, again, I suspect he may not have been the easiest person to get along with. Um, I, I think he may have clashed with uh, some of the other uh, senior uh, pupils who were now in charge of the school and uh, now that his teacher had died. But for whatever reason, uh, he did uh, leave them, uh, as we'll see. Um, fortunately, he had already learned a great deal from Shunsho. Um, and in addition to uh, the print design, he had also learned how to do very gorgeous, elegant paintings. Uh, because Shunsho, um, for about the last 10 years of his life, shifted most of the print design work onto his students, and he himself concentrated on painting. Um, he was very famous for his gorgeous paintings of beautiful women in fashionable clothes. Um, and even though we don't have works by Hokusai, uh, or not very many of them uh, from the time when he was actually still under Shunsho. He clearly had learned the techniques and we see him doing them um, on his own all through the rest of his life. This, this is where he learned. Um, so paintings on silk, lots of attention to gorgeous fabrics, um, use of, uh, of very, uh, very special, expensive, uh, beautiful pigments um, and so on. And I just compare a painting uh, by Shunsho and a painting uh, by Hokusai. Um, so um, interestingly enough, Hokusai himself did the same thing that Shunsho had done. And toward the end of his life, when he was well established for things like book illustrations and print designs, he concentrated on painting, which was the most statusful thing for an artist to do. Now, um, there were other things uh, that he was also interested in uh, besides of what the Katsukawa school taught. And this may possibly uh, have been what got him into trouble uh, with the other Katsukawa school um, um, artists. They may have felt that he was being disloyal um, when he went out and studied various other things. Um, he was interested in many different art schools that were being practiced uh, in of Japan during that time. Um, it's very interesting and I don't have time to go into it tonight, but I'll show you just one very striking example. Um, he was very interested in uh, Western perspective. Um, now in traditional Asian perspective, um, the things that are farther away are uh, typically uh, placed higher up uh, in the picture plane. Um, and receding lines are parallel, they don't, they don't converge, you just have to imagine them going back into the distance and distances higher up. Um, in about the 1740s, the Japanese found out about vanishing point perspective um, from a, a combination of, we think, this is all guesswork, of imported uh, European books 
um, which actually the reason they didn't discover it sooner is that European books were banned until the 1720s, um, or at least from the 1630s until the 1720s. So then they started coming in and eventually the artists discovered those interesting looking pictures. Um, they were also getting Chinese uh, books and prints that had been influenced by a Western perspective. And what I always love about this is that the Japanese liked the new way of drawing very much. They thought it was really cool um, to have things that were so sort of magically real looking, but they didn't take it very seriously. You know, if you study Western art, it's always presented as a great, you know, artistic and technical discovery. It's, you know, the Renaissance, it revolutionizes everything. The Japanese liked it, but they, they thought it was kind of a cute little optical illusion suitable for things like stage sets and children's peep show toys. So there's an example of a children's peep show toy um, with a, um, a, that's actually a print that's been hand colored so heavily it looks like a painting um, by a painter, a Kyoto painter named Maruyama Okyo, um, who later incorporated a Western perspective into um, Japanese style ink paintings. Um, very successfully became a really major artist in the 18th century. But this is from just before Hokusai was born. So the perspective prints went in and out of fashion in several cycles, and Hokusai himself was designing them uh, in the uh, seventh, late 1780s and early 1790s, um, as a first as a student of the Katsukawa school and then later on his own. Um, I particularly like the one of the haunted house down in the bottom right corner, because he uses the perspective to make it look very, very real. But then he puts in these wonderful monsters. I, I always think of this as being like a horror movie with really good special effects. So that's what he's doing in two dimensions. Nevertheless, this was not a specialty of the Katsukawa school. It was not something that he, um, that he really uh, learned from Shunsho. So this may be an example of what they didn't like, his, his eclecticism. So he um, was, uh, he was actually uh, had quite a problem for a while uh, because he got kicked out of the studio where he worked. Um, he didn't have a job. Um, there, there are rumors about him uh, working for some other painters for a while and also getting kicked out. Um, he supposedly mouthed off to one employer or he, uh, not, not directly actually, what he did was criticize um, a painting by uh, the person he was working for. This is not a smart thing to do when you're, you know, you have a wife and children and you're desperate for uh, money. But anyway, eventually, happily for us, um, he uh, landed on his feet. He found a good job uh, with a family, uh, a family of painters called the Tawaraya. And what had happened uh, was that the, uh, the head of the family, uh, who was teaching his young son to succeed him as a painter, died suddenly. Um, it was just a small family school, not a huge studio like a Shunsho's. Um, so they had a problem because the, the son was still too young to take over. Um, and they solved it by hiring Hokusai. And he got to have all the connections that this small but successful family school had established. He got to use uh, the artist's name that was handed down. This is one, one of the 30 some names that he used throughout his career. Uh, so he became Tawaraya Sori, uh, S-O-R-I. Um, and he used that name. The first uh, Sori was the man who had died. Hokusai was Sori number two. And the young, the young uh, boy that he was training eventually became Sori number three. Um, so this went on for several years and it ended amicably in 1798. At that point, the son could take over uh, and he took the Sori name. And that was when Hokusai took the name Hokusai. He'd been using it for a while already with Sori. It means Northern Studio, um, but um, he then took that as his name. So the two works I'm showing you here, one by Sori, the young, the young one uh, on the right, and beautiful, beautiful painting of a, a courtesan, um, deliberately done in subdued colors to show off the very elegant uh, patterns of the clothing uh, and using all those techniques that Hokusai had learned from Shunsho and passed on. The other print is by Hokusai himself. It's something called a surimono, a privately published print. Um, and uh, these were very beautiful deluxe uh, prints that were not sold in stores, they were made on commission. Usually the people who commissioned them were the affluent members of amateur poetry clubs. 
Um, so Hokusai now, thanks to the uh, family he was working for, uh, had introductions into those clubs. And he was, since he was very good, uh, they hired him to work for them and he became a very successful uh, designer of Surimono, um, the privately uh, produced prints. So in 1798, he went independent. And from that time on, he never belonged to a school of art again. Um, he did have many pupils. So in a way you could say he had a school of his own, but he did not do what Shuncho did and establish a large studio. He would teach people for a while and then they would become independent and go off and do their own thing. And they went in many different directions, which is quite interesting. Meanwhile, he went on doing the Surimono. He went on doing paintings um, and he became very well known as a book illustrator. Um, he, did, uh, he did poetry books, um, you see uh, at the, uh, the upper um, left, the women looking through a telescope. These are illustrations of poems, similar to what he did uh, for the poetry clubs, but these were sold in stores and anyone could buy them. Um, he did illustrations of novels. Um, there was a new type of, of fiction that became very popular uh, just at the beginning of the 19th century, long historical stories, often with something fantastic in them. Um, and he was very good at illustrating those. Um, you see the, the hero with his bow, uh, which is so strong that even these demons all together can't, can't bend it, but of course he can because he's uh, so, uh, so good. Um, and then there is the, uh, the wonderful manga. He did art books, how to draw books. Um, the sketches were really intended um, as well, they were actually put together by his pupils from things he'd done for them. So it was really intended as a kind of how to draw book, things for people to copy, but people loved it so much that they bought it away just because the pictures were so, uh, so fun. So that really established him then. He'd been a fairly successful artist for some time, but from 1815, 1815 on, he was really a household name uh, in Japan because of his best selling book, but he wasn't done yet. Um, so he did very well in the 1810s. In the 1820s, he had a lot of personal problems. Um, his, uh, he was widowed for the second time. Um, he was, was seriously ill. He lost a lot of money, uh, basically went bankrupt because of some sort of bad behavior by his grandson. Um, we don't quite know what exactly. Uh, remember, he's already in his 60s. Um, so he's, he's got this grandson who's giving him all kinds of trouble. Um, but finally, um, beginning in about 1830, when he was 70 years old, uh, he did something even more spectacular, became even more famous in Japan and eventually around the world. And that was the series of uh, prints the, known as the 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Um, Back in my teaching days, I used to have a trick question that I sometimes put on exams. How many prints in the 36 views of Mount Fuji? And the answer is 46, because it was such a hit that he made 10 extra, uh, presumably at the request of the publisher. So you saw the wave, here's the red Fuji again, um, the, uh, the uh, windy day with the, you know people's tissue paper blowing away. Um, I particularly like the uh, barrel maker. And if you look very carefully, you can see Mount Fuji through the barrel. Um, it's example, an example of him playing with composition. And he sometimes, he basically uses the, the Western vanishing point perspective, but sometimes he plays with it. If you look at Mount Fuji reflected in the lake, um, there are a couple of things odd here. It's not quite, the reflection is not quite where it would be if you were looking straight at the mountain. Um, and um, the mountain is shown in summer with all the snow melted off it, but look at the reflection. The reflection is how you actually think of the mountain with the snow on it. Um, so it's, it's kind of surreal. Um, and he's just invited you to think about reality and illusion. This was a huge success. Um, and the landscape was pushed up to the same level as prints of kabuki actors and prints of beautiful women. All of a sudden, this was something people really wanted and would happily buy lots and lots of. Um, and that is thanks to Hokusai. Um, then um, Hiroshige followed up on that, um, and various other artists did that also. Um, here are two more series by Hokusai his waterfalls and his bridges, um, which also uh, did very well now that this is established as something people uh, really like. 
And another uh, genre of painting, uh, not painting, excuse me, um, printmaking that he made uh, also very popular um, is what's known as bird and flower pictures or bird and flower prints. Um, that's a term in East Asian art history that actually goes back to ancient China. It comes from the Song Dynasty in China uh, where detailed studies up in paintings because of course um, not, uh, not color printing yet, um, became very popular at that time. It was handed down to Japan as paintings. And then now for the first time, it becomes hugely popular in woodblock prints. So really um, almost anyone can go out and buy a very gorgeous professionally produced uh, image of this kind. And other things too. Um, there's another artist, Kuniyoshi, who's famous for doing the warrior prints, um, but Hokusai himself also did some of them. Um, and there are two examples. He did some wonderful ghosts and monsters. Uh, and there's the plate ghost, uh, the woman who uh, either was murdered or as the case may be committed suicide because she'd broken a precious porcelain plate and her body rises up out of the well uh, where she uh, was drowned, uh, moaning about the, uh, the porcelain plates. Um, so usually you just see the figure of a woman over the well, but Hokusai drew her as made up of plates. What are we doing? I'm talking fast because we're running out of time. I, I said I could go on about all of these. Um, toward the end of his life, he really focused on paintings, just as his own teacher had done. And uh, this is one of my favorite paintings at the MFA, uh, The Waterfall. It's the same subject that he'd done earlier uh, in a print. Um, so you see the, uh, the large woodblock print and then the really spectacular uh, painting of the poet uh, admiring the waterfall that was done actually in the year that he died, probably just months uh, before he died, but clearly he still uh, until almost the end uh, has all of his um, fabulous uh, artistic powers. Um, so that takes us through our whirlwind view of Hokusai's uh, eventful artistic life. Um, and just a few years after his death, everything changes. In 1853, uh, Matthew Perry shows up in the waters off Japan, accompanied by at least one person from Georgia, if not more. Um, and in 1854, Perry secures uh, what he was after, which is an agreement that Japan will now begin to trade with the rest of the world world. Uh, previously, they had very limited uh, contact. Uh, they traded with the Netherlands uh, and with China and Korea, and even that was very, very limited, but now they start to open up. Um, in 1858, a number of treaties are signed, um, and uh, in 1860, the port of Yokohama uh, opens uh, as a treaty port, and goods from Japan start flooding into the rest of the world, including France, uh, where um, in the 1850s, um, Hokusai's work is discovered by French artists. Now, this young man, uh, Brachmond, is said to have been the first, uh, the person who really started the movement that became known as Japonism. Uh, and uh, my French is terrible, excuse me. Um, but uh, he is supposed to have been the first, and the date of this event um, is, is questioned um, some say it was 1856, but others feel that it should have been 1858. At any rate, what happened was that he visited a friend of his who had just received a porcelain tea service shipped to him by French merchants in Japan um, and stuck into the box either as either to help uh, one, one theory is that it was to help wedge the, uh, the porcelain securely so that it wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, knock around uh, in the crate, but there was a little paperback book, uh, which seems to have been one volume of the Hokusai manga. So Brachmon just fell in love with this little book of charming pictures. Um, he tried to get his friend to sell it to him, um, didn't get it right away, but eventually he did manage to acquire, uh, acquire it himself, went around showing it to all his friends, and this supposedly how the French art world discovered Hokusai. Um, was very influential. I show you something that was done by Brockmond himself, um, the, uh, the so-called Service Rousseau, because it was made for someone named Rousseau. It is a porcelain dinner service uh, created in France in 1866. 
um, with uh, motifs of uh, flowers and uh, animals, um, some of which are taken out of a Hokusai manga and other Japanese books. So uh, already uh, it's beginning to, uh, to influence um, artists. Uh, in the 1860s, uh, Japanese prints became very popular. They were sold uh, in stores uh, in Paris. Um, and even after having been shipped over from Japan, they were still quite inexpensive uh, because they had been inexpensive in the first place. Uh, and people began to get very excited about them and to collect them. Uh, and we start seeing them in the background of um, images of uh, artist studios. Um, this is Manet's famous portrait of Zola and uh, the Museum of Fine Arts happens to have um, another uh, impression of the very same Japanese print that you can see in the background of the painting. I always thought that it belonged to Zola, but apparently um, I recently learned this painting was actually done in Manet's studio, so probably it was his. And you can find many uh, paintings uh, around this period that have Japanese prints in the background. Uh, perhaps the most famous of all is one that uh, belongs to us, um, 1876. Um, uh, Monet's uh, wife uh, dressed up in a, a very, uh, very fancy kimono. Um, and I, uh, there are many interpretations of this painting, but many people think it was kind of a send up of the fad for everything Japanese that was absolutely at its height in, uh, in France in the 1870s, that he was just deliberately throwing as many Japanese things into the uh, picture as possible. Uh, and joking about it because his wife was not a natural blonde, she's wearing a wig. Um, you know, she, she was a small dark haired French woman who, who probably could have passed as Japanese in a dim light. Um, but there she is, you know, playing around. Um, 1876. Now, this is significant for Boston, because although as far as I know, he never knew Monet, a certain young doctor from Boston was a student in Paris at the time. Uh, and he became caught up in the love of everything Japanese, although he, he didn't really fully develop it until later on. Meanwhile, back in the US, uh, a certain museum opened its doors for the first time. Um, technically, we've already uh, had our 150th anniversary because the MFA was established as an institution in 1870. But it took a while to raise the money and build the building. And so finally, uh, this first museum was opened in 1876. Um, and it was in uh, Copley Square, where if you know Boston, it's where the Copley Plaza Hotel uh, is today, um, the, the hotel that my father used to refer to as the costly pleasure. Um, but anyway, uh, this is what the first version of the MFA looked like. In Philadelphia, the, the centennial, I was about to say bicentennial, no, it was the first time, the centennial exposition took place celebrating 100 years of American uh, independence. But uh, this was a World's Fair with uh, exhibits sent from all around the world, um, including an entire uh, building uh, set by the Japanese government and full of interesting uh, trade goods uh, that they hope people would get excited about and want to buy from Japan. Uh, one of the many, so this was really when Americans first discovered Japanese culture, 1876, you can date it pretty closely. One of the people who went to the show and got excited about Japan was a marine biologist from Salem, Massachusetts. And there he is, um, Edward Sylvester Morse. Um, so he went off to Japan uh, in, his, uh, in his capacity as a marine biologist. Um, he did research on uh, the, uh, the sea life off the coast of Japan. Um, and he was invited to teach at the Imperial University, which was the ancestor of the University of Tokyo today. Um, meanwhile, um, as a hobby, he became very interested in Japanese ceramics uh, and did a massive collection, uh, which uh, eventually was sold to the museum in 1892. And there is uh, some of it in the old cases uh, that it was once displayed in. Now, he assembled a whole group of friends, a group of uh, Bostonians uh, who got together uh, in Japan. And these are, we sometimes call them the gang of four, uh, the four men who were responsible of, for the formation of the Japanese art collection in Boston. Uh, so there is Morse uh, at the left. 
Um, and uh, the two in the middle are very famous, uh, Okakura, who of course is Japanese himself, um, and then Ernest Fenollosa, uh, who was the first curator of Japanese art uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts uh, and indeed uh, anywhere in the US. So that was the first. Um, Fenollosa, well, Morse was so successful at the university that they asked him to recommend other people to come and teach in Japan. He suggested Fenollosa, uh, whose field was um, was called philosophy, but was more what we would call today economics and political um, um, political science. Um, so we could say something like economic and political philosophy was what Finolosa taught. Um, and he and Finolosa in his classes met a very bright young Japanese man, Okakura, um, who uh, after he graduated in 1880 uh, became uh, a colleague, uh, and he was the one who really um, made it possible for them to talk to Japanese scholars uh, at the highest intellectual level about the history of Japanese art and really learn about it in a serious way. Um, later on, the two of them uh, went around um, on behalf of the Japanese government, cataloging uh, important works of art around Japan uh, to make a note of things that should be uh, particularly protected. Um, this was especially important during the Meiji period, because remember, Japan is now going full speed ahead with modernization. Um, they're much more interested in new things than old things. Uh, and these two, uh, particularly Okakura, are, are saying very loudly, you know, the heritage is, is very important and you should protect it. Uh, so that is what Okakura is especially remembered for. Uh, Morse, interestingly enough, is remembered for having uh, been the first to do scientific archaeology uh, in Japan, because while he was studying um, marine life, he noticed that some of those shell mounds were actually basically the, gar the garbage dumps of prehistoric cultures. Um, and he organized some of his students from the university to go and excavate them in a very careful, um, methodical way. So that's what he's known for in Japan. Now, this brings us to the gentleman on the right, William Sturgis Bigelow. Um, he was actually a medical doctor from a very distinguished family of Boston doctors. Um, and he was the person who had been a young medical student in Paris in the 1870s. Uh, he had studied under Louis Pasteur, who was probably the most prominent physician in the world at that time. And he had been swept up in the uh, Japonisme movement and had already begun to collect uh, works of Japanese art while he was living in Paris. So he had uh, definitely some books. We know because some of his books that we have have, um, have marks of French dealers uh, in them. Um, we know he collected Netsuke and probably he was already collecting prints, although we don't have definite proof of that. Um, he had lots and lots of money. Um, he, um, he, he came back from France, but did not get along with his overbearing father. Um, his father was, was quite the hotshot doctor um, at the Harvard Medical School and the, the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and so on, and they did not get along. So young Dr. Bigelow, who by now had become friends with Edward Morse, ran away to Japan, gave up medicine forever, and spent the rest of his life collecting Japanese art, uh, which he could do because he had lots of money. Um, and it had come to him from his mother's family, so his father didn't control it. That's, that's important. Um, anyway, just to, to quickly show you, I'm going to run through these. You probably have seen these before if you heard the lectures by Ann Morse. So here is Finolosa, our first uh, curator of Japanese art. And one of the most important things that he acquired, which actually is the most, in my opinion, the most important work of Japanese art outside Japan, uh, the fabulous a scroll. Here is Okakura in later life. I always thought of him this way, and I was amazed when I saw that picture of, you know, the cute young guy in his 20s. Um, whoa, is that Okakura? Yes, it is, um, but this is what he looked like later on. Um, and we have a very beautiful a Buddhist sculpture that was once in his collection and was purchased by his family after his death. Finolosa was our first curator. Um, Okakura himself uh, also uh, was a curator at the MFA uh, a little bit later. Um, and he is the one that the garden is named after uh, because Tenshin was his art name, the heart of heaven. Uh, and so the garden is named for him. There's our friend Bigelow. 
um, and uh, you see him as a, as a distinguished uh, trustee of the museum in later years on the left, uh, and then on the right when he was in Japan, uh, dressed as a, pil as a pilgrim going to a Buddhist mountain temple. Um, he did actually convert to Buddhism. He was very uh, serious and sincere about his studies, and he collected everything. Um, so these are all things that were given to us by Bigelow, and I just picked to show the variety. Um, sculpture, paintings, no masks, lacquer, textiles, um, swords, arms and armor, and of course, woodblock prints. This is not Hokusai, it's Sharaku, but it's one of my favorites from a Bigelow's collection. Now, the very interesting thing about the woodblock prints is that he was the only one in that group of four who liked them even though so many people uh, in the West were really keen on them. Um, the Boston group, except for Bigelow, uh, Fenelosa and Okokura Morse didn't care one way or another. Ceramics were his thing. He wasn't much interested in anything else. Fenelosa and Okokura were very proud of the fact that they were in touch with the Japanese intellectuals. And they had the same attitude that the Japanese intellectuals of the time did toward the prints, which are low, vulgar, popular culture. A proper museum should not collect such things. Uh, but Bigelow, bless him, um, really loved them, and probably because of his early experience in France. And I, I always think of him as being very stubborn in a polite kind of way. Uh, while he was in Japan, his father apparently actually um, sent him a telegram saying, come back and go to work in the hospital right now. And Bigelow said no. Um, and so I, I suspect that, uh, that you know, Fidelosa and Okokura said, ah, oh, those things are trash. Don't waste your money on them. And Bigelow said, I like them. Um, so at any rate, uh, this is just my imagination. There's no record of anything of the kind. Well, we do know about the telegram from his father. But um, at any rate, he went on collecting them. And so that's why we have so many. We have so many that they were not even fully uh, accessioned and numbered uh, for many, many years. We finally actually got grant money to make the final push. I don't mean to say they were neglected. Curators had worked on them for years, but it's really quite difficult uh, without benefit of present day technology. It was really the existence of such things as databases that made it possible. Um, so we got a substantial amount of grant money uh, from three different sources. Um, anonymous American, anonymous Japanese, and the State Street Bank. Um, so those, those were the three. Um, and uh, we had probably almost 100 people working on this at different times, um, and just some, some pictures of uh, people uh, hard at work uh, to give them their proper accession numbers. That's the museum term for the registration numbers. Um, note their locations, prepare them for photography, uh, and gradually fill in information uh, in the database. So there you see it going on. Now, once we've done that, then we could start exhibiting them and having shows. And we've done many uh, exhibits at this point, both at the MFA um, and uh, traveling shows elsewhere. And I'm going to now, in the last few minutes, zip through our plans for what we want to do in 2023, um, subject to many possible uh, changes as we go along. The basic idea uh, is to show, uh, my plan is roughly about half of this will be works by Hokusai, um, most of which we showed already in the 2015 show, but we will be combining them this time with works by other artists. Um, and I want to show him together with his students, um, and in this uh, slide, his student Hoke, uh, who was known for Sudimono. I, I picked waves, obviously. Um, so there's one of his students. Um, his rivals, um, one of the biggest was Hiroshige, uh, who was a generation younger, but was the second artist to really pick up on the popularity of landscape prints and do many very wonderful and beautiful things. Um, being younger, uh, he outlived Hokusai, went on uh, doing uh, very gorgeous landscapes for a long time. So there you see some waves by him uh, from, eight, this, this is from 1858. Um, and then uh, even people who discovered Hokusai uh, much later, um, and I show you a, yeah, a French print from 1894, um, that actually I think is once again a kind of humorous re reference uh, to the, uh, the fad for Japanese art in France. Uh, he imagined 
questions, people being just overwhelmed by this, this wave. And we can continue, there are many, many waves. Um, it is, for example, uh, an uh, and emoji and, uh, and so forth. So um, the idea is that I'll start out by showing Hokusai with his own teacher. Um, it's a chance to show off some, not just this uh, one that I showed you already, but we have a number of beautiful paintings by Shunsho, and it will be interesting to show them with Hokusai. His pupils, I mentioned his daughter. There is that gorgeous painting by her that was the only thing not by him we put in the 2015 show. Uh, and just as an example of Hokusai as a teacher is that cute little sketch, which was actually given to us by Edward Sylvester Morse. So he did have a few things besides the ceramics, including one, one charming uh, little Hokusai drawing, showing his pupils how to balance a dancing figure. You basically, you drop a line from the chin to one of the feet, doesn't matter which foot. But as long as you've got that straight line, the figure will look balanced and will not look as if he's about to fall over. Drawing tip from Hokusai. Um, the uh, section of Sunimono, because not only did Hokusai do them himself, um, he taught some of the most prominent artists uh, in that field. Um, you saw Hoke, uh, that was a, that square Sunimono with the wave, uh, Hoke's pupil Gakute, uh, and there were some others who were also uh, Hokusai's pupils doing these very beautiful prints, uh, which often have uh, very fine printing, metallics, embossing, and so on. The manga uh, and their impact. So once again, um, I'm wishing now I'd put in, put in some different pages from the manga instead of repeating the fish. But the reason I had them in the first place is that we have an etching by Brock Bond. We don't yet have any of the Service Rousseau, but I think we're going to buy some. I'm talking to the curator in European uh, decorative arts, and I think we will be buying. We certainly should have had them already. Um, so maybe this is our occasion to get something nice for the uh, museum. We do have some etchings that Brockmore made, sketching out his ideas uh, for the series or for the, the porcelain tableware. Um, and uh, also manga. Um, this uh, is uh, one, of, one of the books we've published. It's a set of drawings uh, that we have at the MFA. Um, at the time, I thought the title was tacky, but now I kind of like it. This was not my idea. It was the editor's idea. We'll call it the lost manga. Um, it's drawings for a book that looks as if it may have been intended as a sequel to the manga. Um, and many different subjects, there are Buddhist deities, a beautiful uh, uh, floral designs, and so on. And what's really exciting is that out of the blue, after we published this book, the British Museum acquired a set of drawings that are pretty clearly from the same set. Um, so we're very, there's all kind of, if you, you just Google the British Museum and Hokusai, and you'll find it. it's been in the news for, uh, for a while now, and they've got an exhibition on right now. Um, with, with, among other things, a picture of me on the wall saying how great this is. Um, so, so I will be putting ours uh, into the show, and uh, we are still really in the process of studying this. Um, also, um, we have a number of other um, Hokusai-related drawings. Okay, so waves again. I want At this point, I want to go into thematic things, such as waves, landscapes, waterfalls. And I can't resist telling you the thing in the middle. I was so thrilled to find this. It's a little watercolor painting uh, of some kind of design. I think it was probably intended as a fabric pattern. You can see it would repeat. This is uh, Hokusai uh, meets the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, Lois Melu Jones, um, woman of uh, African-American art. Um, she did this when she was very young. Um, she became well known as a, uh, as a painter and a designer. And lo and behold, it's based on Hokusai prints. So we will have that in the, uh, in the show as an example of his later influence. Uh, flora and Fauna. Here I'm showing Hiroshige. And I'll also have some nice um, Art Nouveau type um, works. Uh, we have some ceramics and uh, very interesting uh, European uh, decorative arts that have the same kind of uh, very gorgeous uh, sinuous floral designs. Um, yes, uh, heroes and action and monsters. Um, 
Kuniyoshi is the artist most famous for these, but the interesting thing is he was inspired by Hokusai's book illustrations. So he looked at Hokusai's black and white book illustrations and turned them into big color prints. And then Hokusai himself said, well, I can do that. And so, so he made some large color prints of, of warriors uh, himself and then passed that on to various students uh, who also did warrior prints in what is quite clearly a Hokusai style. So we'll have a section on those. And then I want to wind up with contemporary things. This is still, of all the sections, it's very much under development. Under development. Um, but that interesting piece of furniture is something we actually already uh, own, how to wrap five waves. Um, and uh, we have some other things uh, by uh, John Cedarquist, who actually um, is a surfer as well as a, a maker of fine furniture. So he's very interested in waves. Uh, we had one of his pieces already in the 2015 show, and we've now acquired more. Um, everybody knows now who Yayoi Kusama is. Um, and we have here a print that she made. Now there are lots and lots of Japanese images of Mount Fuji and you can't necessarily say that they're all based on Hokusai, but uh, she specifically called it Fuji in seven colors and made it in seven different colors, um, such as red and pink and orange and some other colors, I forget uh, what exactly. Um, so I think the seven colors are a clue that she she is riffing on the uh, the red Fuji. So there's her orange Fuji with her trademark polka dots in the uh, in the background. Um, and um, again, I don't know if you know Teraoka. He is a he uh, lives in. He was originally from Japan. Lives in Hawaii now. I, I think he's probably a U.S. citizen by now. Um, but he does very interesting, mostly paintings. But some of his works have been made into prints. Um, you remember I did mention that there are a few artists who sometimes have their work made into prints by the old method where other people do the, the carving and printing, and that's what this is, and this is pretty clearly a riff on a very famous erotic book illustration by Hokusai. I'm deliberating whether to put this in or not. I don't know if it will upset anyone, but but maybe if we stick it in a corner. Uh, we had some erotic works in one of our shows that were sort of behind a pillar and it was okay, nobody complained. So maybe we can do something like that with this. Um, I wish we owned the Hokusai original, we don't, but I'm hoping maybe we can borrow it, we'll see. Um, so I've, I've run over time, but I hope not too much. So um, that is that is the plan and we it's very much, under construction at this point, and any ideas that you have are welcome. Thank you. So how shall we do this now? All right, so uh, yeah, Dr. Thompson, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation, and we certainly learned the true impact I had, I think, uh, in his works, uh, and through his legacy, and, and his equals um, too, right? So. Uh, that continues even today. Uh, but at this time, we'd like to start the Q&A portion of our program. And um, we'll start off, uh, off with a few questions that I have. And then okay. I'll we'll certainly open up the, uh, the microphone, I guess, here in person to our audience here. And then also yeah. online, okay. if people do have questions, um, okay. go on the chat box and reading them out to you. But, okay. um, so we learned all about Hokusai. Um, <laughs> and I uh, want to learn a little bit about you. So okay. what was your journey? How did you get connected to art? How did you get connected to Japan? How did you go from uh, a teacher uh, at Oberlin, yeah. which uh, I have yeah. a personal connection to, and then also Vassar <laughs> yes. of Oregon, and then uh, mm -hmm. to one of, I guess, three uh, curators of Japanese art you know, at the MFA, right? So yes. can you tell us about yes. your story? Yes, yes. Um, well, it, it's complicated. It always is. But, but the simple version is um, I was a linguistics major in college, um, and I wanted to study a language that was really, really different from English. Um, and oh boy, did I pick one. Um, I actually, I started my, my, my foreign language was German originally, but that's almost completely gone now. It's, it's just totally buried under, under Japanese. Um, so I, uh, I studied a Japanese language, which was fascinating. Uh, and uh, then I, uh, I went off to Japan um, and I was actually at one point planning to go to graduate school in linguistics and study Japanese historical linguistics and look at, you know, classical Japanese and look at dialects and try to figure out how they diverged from each other and things of that kind. But when I was in Japan, 
I kept running off to go to museums or Buddhist temples that had particularly good art on display and places like that. And it eventually became clear that that was what I, what I really wanted to be doing. Um, so I, I switched uh, fields. Um, it was a little bit complicated. I'd, I'd started out at Princeton and as a graduate student, and I tried to change into art history, but the program collapsed temporarily. Um, they wound up with no one there to teach it because uh, one, one teacher had retired and the other one had, had gone elsewhere. Um, they did very soon put it back together again, but I was there at just the wrong time. Um, but eventually I wound up at Columbia, which was where I finally got the degree. But it was, it was the language that got me into it. Yeah. Uh, so my, my next question is, um, you know, you've create, curated a variety of exhibitions, obviously, and have uh, some exciting ones coming up as well. Can you share more about some of your favorite past exhibits? And then what exciting projects you have coming up in the future? Okay. Well, in addition to, uh, to Hokusai uh, himself, um, actually, um, one of the things that's distracting me from Hokusai right now is that next month, uh, toward the end of November, uh, we will be opening an MFA version of a show that already traveled um, in 2019 to the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, and that is Tattoos in Japanese Prints. Um, which is exactly what it sounds like. And we actually already have a book out on that subject. Um, so it's, uh, there, it's a lot of work by Kuniyoshi, the guy whose specialty was warrior prints and many of his warriors have gorgeous tattoos, um, which uh, were uh, extremely fashionable at the time and are still being used as patterns for real tattoos even today. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, it's a delicate subject in Japan because uh, to, to this day, there is a strong association with organized crime. Um, so we actually pitched this show as a traveling show in Japan and nobody would touch it. <laughs> but San Francisco was interested because that is apparently the, the US center of Japanese style tattooing. Um, and now we're going to do it in Boston also. So, so that's fine. So that's one thing. Then what we are going to do in Japan, um, opening in Tokyo in January, um, is a show that combines um, the warrior prints, although not the guys with tattoos, um, but, but warriors uh, such as uh, what you saw uh, by, uh, by Hokusai and by uh, Kuniyoshi, um, and the real Japanese swords from our collection. So we sort of have the real thing and then the pictorial fantasy of it. Um, and we'll be doing that in uh, January. Uh, we had a show in the past that uh, was a lot of fun, which was the artist Kuniyoshi and then his rival Kunisada. And these were the two people who were doing figure prints at the time when Hokusai and Hiroshige were doing their landscapes. We do have a couple questions uh, online. And if you have questions here in person, uh, just raise your hand. But uh, just one from online real quick. Mm -hmm. What is left to collect? Uh, is Hokusai's body of work largely preserved or in private collection? Could there still be some surprises? Yes, there definitely could be. And those drawings that the British Museum just purchased are a very good example. Um, it's, it's in a way surprising that they had not been noticed earlier, but part of it was, uh, remember these are drawings, so they don't have all the signatures and seals and so forth that were legally required uh, for prints. And they had been attributed to one of Hokusai's better pupils, um, a pupil named Isai. Um, but uh, after further study, um, people are now pretty much in agreement that no, those are actually by Hokusai himself. Um, we still don't know what they are and what we have and also what the British Museum has is drawings uh, for a printed book that was never actually made. Because of course, if it had been printed, the drawings would have been destroyed. These are the block ready drawings that would have been glued to the block and cut through if they'd gone ahead with publication. So why did they not go ahead with publication? Um, how did these things get separated and wind up in two different collections? Um, there's a lot going on. Um, and um, Hokusai, Hokusai prints do, um, do still circulate on the market. They're getting more and more expensive. Um, a, the, a, a great wave just broke the record fairly recently and went for about a million and a half dollars US. Um, yeah, so uh, they're, they're still around. 
Um, and you know, you might get lucky and find something for far less than that that is that is good. So um, it's it's definitely very interesting. I say do do keep an eye on things that are going on at the British Museum. There's a big research project there. Um, not only related to their to their new drawings, but um, other uh, Hokusai holdings also. We have a question from the in person. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I wanted to ask a question about the uh, obviously the Great Wave off of Kanagawa. Or uh -huh. great wave off of Kanagawa. Uh, I hope this is true because I did a search that it's true in a podcast, uh -huh. uh, and I want to ask you as, a, as an expert. One of the things that I had heard about why uh -huh. this series was so popular uh -huh. was that Hokusai was was implementing in the print production uh, the use of uh, cutting edge colors and dyes, like for example, Prussian blue. Yes, yes. In this particular case. Yeah. Is that true? And did he implement any other foreign colors into any of his other works? Yeah. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's somewhat true. Um, as as far as I know, off the top of my head, the innovation is Prussian blue. And it had been done shortly before uh, by another print artist. Um, there's a very good article about it by uh, Henry Smith. Um, it that was published in an in an um, a catalog, a, a book of essays on Hokusai. Um, but uh, another artist, other artists had just started to use it. There are a few examples, though not very many, that predate the Fuji series. Well, even the dating of the Fuji series is questionable, and there are a lot of arguments about it. But the general agreement at this point was that it started in about 1830. Um, and in about 1828, 29, we start seeing the use of the Prussian blue, you know, that gorgeous dark blue color that, that does not fade easily. Uh, I'm not aware of other things, of other colors introduced by Hokusai. I, I think, and it's not, again, it's not so much that he introduced it as that he basically took it and ran with it. You know, he was, just as he was very aware of different styles and different ideas in the art world, and of course, new technology or new, um, new um, well, pigments in this case. Um, so that's the main thing. One thing that surprised everyone was when um, spectrographic analysis was done, it turned out that he is also still using indigo. So the colors in the Great Wave are a mix of a Prussian blue and indigo. One interesting thing about the Fuji series is the early editions, the outlines, which are usually done in black ink, those are in blue. And it's a very dark blue. It almost looks black. You have to look carefully at it to see that it is actually very dark blue. But those are done in indigo, and then the other colors are, um, are Prussian blue. It's uh, the reason it got apparently it was known in Japan already, but it became very cheap, cheap enough to use in inexpensive prints. Apparently, the reason that happened is that it was being imported from China as well as through from or through the Netherlands. And the really interesting question is had the Chinese cut a deal with European middlemen or had they figured out how to manufacture it themselves? So, you know, um, further news on that is, uh, is uh, awaited. Great, we have uh, one more uh, question. We have time for one more question. Anyone in person? If not, I'll take one question from Mark. I have a question actually. <laughs> um, I'd like to know more about the creative process that you and the other curators go through to come up with these exhibitions. Yes, yes. And I would assume that that can be difficult and, and especially such a large collection. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this one was inspired by something that for this very condensed talk, I did not even mention. And that is we have a large and not yet cataloged collection of Hokusai style drawings that were presumably made by the pupils because Bigelow supposedly purchased the entire contents of um, the studio of uh, an artist who had been a pupil of Hokusai and who died sometime in the 1880s while Bigelow was in Japan. So this is a very obscure artist. Um, and I did find some things signed by him among the drawings and frankly, they're not that good. Uh, but uh, he was a pupil of Hokusai. So we've got all these Hokusai style drawings of varied degrees of quality. Um, a few of them I look at and go, my God, could it be by Hokusai? I wonder. Um, I suspect 
they're probably all by pupils, but it's still very interesting because it's a different kind of a creative process in a more literal sense. You really see what was going on, how Hokusai taught. So of course, the basic method is the master draws a model and the students copy it. And sometimes we get um, in that group of drawings that the MFA has, we find something like um, versions by signed by different pupils of Hokusai of the same design, and presumably they're referring to an original by Hokusai himself, which, which may no longer be extant, or maybe it isn't, I just haven't found it yet. So I really wanted to do a big research project on those and then kind of exhibit the findings. Um, and this exhibition grew out of that idea. Um, I still am going to put some of them in, but the big research project will have to wait. So there, there may be, you know, unsuspected treasures uh, in that group of things. We'll find out, I hope. Great, well, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate uh, Thompson Sensei uh, for coming down, <laughs> down all the way from Boston to be part of this uh, yeah. great uh, series uh, as part mm -hmm. of the um, a series that the Japan American Society of Georgia is partnering with the National Association of Japan American Society of Georgia. Uh, and then special big thank you to uh, the U.S. Japan Friendship Commission too. So uh, we certainly appreciate all the great work that they do and for making this series possible and uh, for you to be able to visit us here in Atlanta, <laughs> for you to visit uh, Dallas, Texas next week, That's and right. then uh, for all the other yeah. curators part of the series to visit the different places uh, throughout the JAS network. So thank you again. Uh, but uh, we do have a number of special programs coming up uh, this fall, including uh, Midori Goto concert, uh, actually right here in the same building downstairs. Uh, we're going to have a uh, violin uh, you know, performance by Midori-san, uh, and then a meet and greet uh, reception afterwards. So please join us at the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra next Saturday. Uh, we do have a TPS, or Toyota Production System, Kanishibai webinar uh, coming up as well, uh, October uh, 29th, in which we're partnering with uh, the Georgia Tech Cyber. Uh, so we're looking forward to that and learning the secrets of Toyota. Uh, and then uh, just a day later on October 30th, the day before Halloween, we do have a uh, onigiri cooking demonstration in which we're partnering with the Japan Society of Boston uh, and also the Japan American Society of Houston as well uh, as uh, we'll be learning how to make onigiri and there's a special onigiri uh, campaign uh, in which uh, Washoku is actually donating a uh, free meal to the kids in need for every onigiri that, that we make and we uh, post online on social media. So definitely join us for that as well. Uh, but uh, thank you again, Dr. Thompson. We look forward to welcoming you back to Atlanta hopefully soon. And uh, perhaps uh, there will be another Atlanta-Boston connection uh, in the World Series as the Braves and the Red Sox are in the playoffs. Right? We'll see. Yeah, but, uh, let's give her another round of applause. Thank you.